Okay, so good afternoon and welcome to the Learning with Unstructured Data course. Uh, my name is Ludwig, I'll be teaching this course. And to, uh, in this session, so I'll break down these uh, two hours into two one-hour blocks, so we can have a short break. And this first uh, session today is basically to give you an introduction to deep learning, what promises we can make at the beginning and I hope to fulfill during the course and also to get everyone up to speed at the same level. So those of you who did the machine learning course uh, last semester probably will find some things repeated. Those who didn't, don't panic. Uh, we'll try to uh, give everyone the same uh, starting point today. So I'm going to talk a bit about how the course will work and how we'll do the, the assessment and then uh, give a, an historical overview of uh, artificial intelligence and neural networks, so how these things fit together in the, the progress in these areas. Then I'll talk a bit about machine learning with an emphasis of this idea of using nonlinear transformations to increase the power of the, uh, our model. And then the difference between deep learning specifically and machine learning in general and what deep learning can offer. So for the more bureaucratic uh, part, this, uh, uh, the purpose of this course, so officially, uh, is to give you um, a foundation of uh, artificial neural networks, specifically in deep models, so with, with the many layers. And we're going also to cover some specific uh, types of architectures, like convolution networks, autoencoders, and then uh, in the second part we'll talk about the recurrence and generative models, and also a major uh, goal here is to give you practical experience, uh, in particular with TensorFlow, and actually working and uh, creating your own models, training them, and, and dealing with, uh, with real data. This will be mostly on the second half of the semester, so the first part will be, uh, I'll be teaching the first part, and this is more the, the theoretical foundation and learning how to use TensorFlow, and then you'll have uh, a, sh a small test in, in April, and uh, uh, a first tutorial just to show that you can use TensorFlow, so that you learn how to use TensorFlow. You can cover uh, the, the different subjects that we, we cover here, and create your own tutorial to like a, a demo, like those that you can find uh, on the internet. Of course, not exactly like the ones you can find on the internet. <laughs> so this, uh, this would be the, the first half of the semester. And then the second part will be taught by, by Professor Rui Rodrigues from the Mathematics Department. And this will be uh, focused on practical applications. So the, the assessment is divided into these written tests and short tutorials for the first part. And then the final project is half uh, of the grade. So this will be your focus during the second half of the semester. And I'll be covered this uh, first introductory part and then uh, convolutional neural networks, um, autoencoders and representation learning, knowledge transfer and so on. We'll see several examples of this. And mean, in the meantime, in the, the tutorial classes, you'll be learning how to use TensorFlow and the, the, the CADAS interface to build these models, and that's what you'll use to uh, create your tutorial. So the idea is that before starting the second part, you know these basic theoretical uh, concepts, and you have working knowledge of TensorFlow so that you can start focusing with uh, more complex problems, with real data, and so on. This means that you're going to start the, the second part on uh, April 23, which is a, a, a Thursday, until the Wednesday before that, you should finish everything in the first part. So that's the deadline for the, the tutorial, and the week before that, we have the, uh, the test. Okay. So the biography for this course, uh, uh, you have the, in the course site the materials, the slides, and also the lecture notes. Those of you who had the machine learning course, Please note that this is a more recent course, so the lecture notes will be changing quite a lot during the semester and, it's not, and are not as extensive as the ones I, I uh, had for the other part. So keep up to date downloading the PDF and don't kill any trees printing it because it will be changing uh, a lot. These, uh, these books, especially this one, uh, Deep Learning, is one of the, the basics for, for the course, so even though you have uh, these materials in the slides and the lecture notes. You should also take a look at the book because I'll be basing myself uh, on the book quite a lot. 
There's an interesting paper from 2015 on nature about deep learning. You should take a look at that, but this is more a generic uh, overview. And we'll also be uh, using this uh, other book on deep learning. So uh, I'm not sure about the legalities, but I'm sure you can find these books on the internet some way or other. So if, uh, if you download them, you, you should uh, take a look and read. Uh, and each, after each lecture, I will point out some chapters that are more relevant for, for that subject matter. For the software, uh, we have a small problem in, in the lab because updating software in the labs is done once a year and about six months ago TensorFlow 2 was released and we, we could not update uh, it on the lab. So if you want to use the computers on the lab, you can, but you should use Google Collaboratory because then you're using Google uh, services and, and you can use any version of TensorFlow. We're going to be using uh, 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 TensorFlow 2. TensorFlow 2 is significantly different from 1, so uh, lots of tutorials on TensorFlow 1 will not work uh, on 2, but 2 is, is also significantly better, especially for learning how to use. Uh, for your own computers, you can install uh, Anaconda you, if you already have it from machine learning. I think it's sufficiently up to date. If you're not sure, just update Anaconda and then install TensorFlow. I'll let you know at the end of the second lecture exactly w what to do. But this will be the software that we'll be using for, for this course. So, um, just to give a little historical context in uh, uh, this part of machine learning and how it, it fits in with uh, artificial intelligence, the modern concept of artificial intelligence started in the, the mid-1950s uh, with the, the idea that seemed pretty obvious and straightforward at the time, that if you have, we have computers that can do computations, calculations, we can also create intelligence artificial intelligence. So this was basically uh, uh, lots of top minds at the time, Shannon and uh, Minsky and so on, they gathered together for about two weeks to solve this problem of artificial intelligence. So just to straighten things out and build intelligent computers. So they have this conjecture that it's possible to build it in principle and so it's just a matter of rolling up the sleeves and solving the problem. Of course, this was a bit optimistic because uh, uh, we are still trying to find out how to do that. But uh, it started this uh, uh, area of computer science, of artificial intelligence, that initially was most successful uh, in logical systems. So formal systems that use rules and inferred rules. Uh, and they were, the rules could be provided by humans and then the, the system could either generate rules that were consequent of the ones supplied or use those rules to reach some conclusions. For example, this, in 1975, this was a, a, a model for um, identifying types of, of pathogens uh, that followed several rules and then it, it could explain how uh, it got to the conclusion. So, the stain is gram-positive, the morphology is, is round, is a caucus, the growth is in chain, then there is a 70% probability that this is streptococcus. And this would be the kind of artificial, artificial intelligence uh, models that were uh, most successful during the 70s, 80s, so before the 90s. But the, um, the idea of, of uh, simulating artificially uh, a neuron was uh, was uh, predated that by, by a few decades. So in the 1940s, we had this mathematical model of the neuron. The neuron is a, a, a complex cell that has these uh, dendrites that are the inputs, so to speak, so they can be stimulated by, by uh, say, um, neurotransmitters from other cells or direct stimulation from contact, temperature, things like that. And then if the, the stimulus is strong enough, the, the membrane potential, the membrane will depolarize and, and a wave of, uh, of uh, potential will uh, spread through the neurons, through the axon, and will uh, activate the, the extremities there, the synapses, and it will release neurotransmitters for the next uh, neuron. 
So this is something that is non-linear if the stimulus is not enough, then nothing happens. But if it's sufficiently strong, then there is a pulse released by the neuron. And this could be modeled by uh, a simple uh, mathematic model that takes a series of inputs, multiplies each input by uh, a weight, uh, a value, a continuous value, and then sums everything up and passes through some non-linear function that can be simply a threshold. If the weighted sum of the input is high enough, then there is an output of one, otherwise uh, there is no output. So this was uh, called the perception, the, the uh, materialization of this, and in 1958 it was uh, a big success because it was seen as the, the beginning of this computer that would be able to walk, to talk, to see, write, reproduce itself, and so on. So based on this uh, model, it could do uh, anything, and uh, it was uh, the became very famous for a while because of this uh, promise. And the, the, the basic idea here was not only the model, but a way to train the model, to make it learn the appropriate way to achieve some, some uh, results. So the idea is that we have this simple model, the weighted sum of all the inputs, plus a bias value that we can use to shift whether it's harder to make it fire or not overall. And then if this is above uh, zero, the result, then the uh, model, the, the perceptron, outputs one. If it's not, if it's equal or below zero, it outputs a zero. So by changing these weights, we can adjust uh, its response to the input, and we can make it learn to give us the, the results that we want. So the training rule here was to adjust each weight by some delta at each uh, training step and the weights were adjusted whenever there was a difference between the target uh, value, so what we would like the, the perception to output, and the actual output of the perception. So if we give the perception an example and it gives us the correct answer, for example uh, one of the first things they uh, thought is to distinguish in, in a, an emulated perception, so they implemented this on the computer, was to distinguish whether those punched cards had a, a, a hole on the left side or on the right side. So we can say left is zero, one is right, and if the, re, uh, the answer of the perception is correct, we don't change anything, we leave the weights as they are. But if it's wrong, then we adjust the weight slightly to push the perception towards the correct answer. So either towards the higher value if we are below the target or towards the lower value if we are above the target. So with this learning rule, by showing the perceptron 50 cards were punched on one side or, or the other, it would eventually learn how to distinguish them and then would get the, the answers always right. So this shows that this was an intelligent machine capable of learning and it was a, a big success and it was actually implemented. So this is something that may sound weird uh, today because we use the computer for machine learning, but the perception was actually meant to be a physical machine. Uh, this was, uh, it had a, a, a sensor of 20 by uh, 20 pixels, so 400 inputs that would detect lights and it, it could be shown images uh, as the input. And then for training, it would have to output a, a, a classification, one or zero, but uh, the training was done uh, because all these wires were connected to variable resistances and there were electric motors that would adjust the resistance to adjust the weight and the whole thing would learn uh, in the actual machine. So this, this was really a machine uh, created for, for machine learning in the literal sense uh, without even the, the computer. Uh, unfortunately, there was a, a bit of a problem that later uh, they realized is that if you do this, a linear combination and then some threshold, this is a linear classifier. So it can only solve problems where you can, with a straight line, separate the classes. If the problems are more complex than that, it's not possible because you cannot do anything other than a straight line using a linear combination of the input. So this turned out to be just like lin uh, logistic regression or something like that. You can train the, uh, the perception by adjusting the weights of the input, but if the, the data set is not linearly separable, 
the best thing you can do is to find the, the closest straight line to separate them, but cannot solve the problem uh, correctly. So this was a big disappointment because it turned out it wouldn't be able to talk and walk and, and all those things. Uh, and it was basically the same thing as logistic regression, which was around since the 1930s or something like that. So it's, it was just a way of implementing uh, a well-known statistical model with its well-known limitations. So uh, just to remind for some of you or give a brief introduction to, to others, this will not be uh, a very important part of the course, but with logistic regression we basically have a linear combination of the inputs, just like we talked, but then we have a linking function that connects the result of this linear combination to something that we can interpret as a probability. And this is the, the logistic function here that outputs a value between 0 and 1. So we connect these two and now we can train, uh, we can find the parameters that best fit the probability of each example belonging to class 1. So class 1 examples should give output a high probability, class 0 examples should output a low probability, and we can train everything like this. Uh, but this is the same as we can do in the, the model is the same even though the training method may be different but it's the same that we can do with a single neuron if the activation function is this logistic function so the the perceptron was actually even a bit simpler because it had this function here it's just a threshold if it's below zero or above zero uh, but we can make it a bit more sophisticated and use as activation function the logistic function and it's the same as logistic regression so this was a bit of a shock because something that was so promising turned out to be the same as a statistical method that was already a few decades old by this time. <coughs> so this was also uh, something that happened in general in AI because in the beginning the idea of making something artificial intelligent uh, seemed uh, a big revolution but it turned out that we could either write out the rules and the computer compute the, the result there were some, some things that uh, uh, were a, a big advance, like in automating uh, demonstration of theorems and things like that. But in general, it fell very short of the initial promise. So there was this winter of artificial intelligence up until the, the end of the 80s, where the, the thing that was most successful in artificial intelligence was logic systems. Maybe some of you even programmed in Prolog. I don't know if it's still you don't, you learn pro -law. Okay, so this is a, 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 an inheritance from this, uh, this age. Um, up to some years ago, we had pro -law courses. Now we don't even have <laughs> that anymore. But uh, in parallel, there were some advances that were still not very well noted, like the backpropagation in the, in the 70s, and then it was shown it could be used to train networks of neurons. But in general, this was a bad time to work on artificial intelligence. So, in the 90s, things started to change with machine learning. Uh, the idea of machine learning is also uh, old. In, in 1959, we have this, this uh, statement uh, about what should be. So, basically, computers uh, given the ability to learn by themselves. But uh, Mitchell's definition in the, in, the early, in the late 90s is perhaps the, the most uh, quoted one, which is also more formal. If we have uh, a task and some way of measuring performance on that task, then if we have a system that can learn by experience, by examples, to improve performance in that task, this is the idea of machine learning. So this is a, a more precise uh, definition. We want to make the machine improve at something just by showing it examples of how it's done. Uh, and this was uh, successful from the, the 90s, uh, because of some, uh, I'll, I'll talk a bit more, because of some improvements in the, in the models, and it uh, started to have applications in, in many fields. Uh, so things like uh, filtering spam, uh, uh, speech recognition, autonomous driving, and so on, many of these are very recent, but some uh, started uh, in the 90s. And uh, we can consider machine learning to be divided into different types of problems. The idea is always the same. We, we are giving examples and improving performance at something, but what this thing is, 
we'll now determine what kind of models we can use and algorithms and so on. So one thing we can do is, this is called unsupervised learning because we are not giving the system any target uh, value that it needs to, to reach and then uh, measuring if it's reaching the correct value or not. But the, the learner is trying to learn something about the data that can be useful for us. An example of that is clustering, uh, grouping together things that are similar and letting us know which, to which group each element belongs. But in general, we can think of this as uh, of unsupervised learning as we have a set of data that is characterized by feature values. We put it in the learning machine and will give us some information that we can find useful, so new features that we can assign to our example. Uh, for example, in the case of clustering, these could be the cluster labels. These, these two examples belong together, these are in different groups, and so on. Supervised learning is a, a different kind of problem, uh, or category of problems, where we are supervising the ability of the system to give us the correct answer. So, for each example, we know what the answer should be, and we tell the system how wrong it is at each time, and it will try to improve uh, that, uh, their uh, the accuracy. So, the data is fed into the learner, the, the feature values, but not the target that we want. So, for each example, we have some sets of features, but we have a target value too, that we are then going to compare to what the learner is outputting. And this difference between the two will inform the learner of how it will change. The perfection I, I showed before was an example of supervised learning because we tested if the answer was correct and if it was not, we changed the weight in the perfection. Then there, is, uh, there are examples. This is a growing area where we actually mix the two together. This happens a lot when we have uh, an abundance of data but it's costly to label the data correctly. For example, with image recognition. If you can find a very large number of images, but if you need correct labels to tell what is in each image, that is costly because you have to hire people to, to put the labels there. So with uh, uh, semi-supervised learning, we can mix in examples that are not labeled with a, a smaller percentage of examples that are labeled and try to use everything together to improve the results. And then there is also an important class of reinforcement learning, which is similar to supervised learning in the sense that we have a way of measuring uh, the error or something that happened that shouldn't have happened, for example, or the score when playing a game, something like that. But we cannot assign it to any specific uh, example or any specific decision of the learner. For example, uh, in autonomous driving, we know that if the car crashes against the tree, that should not happen, but we cannot immediately tell when was the wrong decision made that led to the crash. So it could have been a few seconds before when the car turned and it should, not something like that. So this gives us a different problem of assigning credit to parts, so to decisions in the learning. We are not going to cover this part in this course. We are going to focus mostly on supervised and supervised and mis-supervised uh, uh, learning. Um, but this is just to give you a, a general idea of, of the kinds of problems we can solve in machine learning, not just with, with deep learning. <coughs> so the traditional approach for this, for uh, uh, solving these kinds of problems, and they can be, for example, extracting new features or finding relations, something like that, approximating some target classification or regression, optimizing the, the, the policy. The policy is the, the, the recipe for doing the correct decisions in, in reinforcement learning. And the traditional approach in machine learning is to use many different models with different kinds of algorithms for uh, different problems. <coughs> and this uh, uh, rise of machine learning in the 90s came because uh, some models were found that could work uh, much better than the, the previous one. So, uh, linear regression, linear models for regression are actually very old. They, in the, the early 1800s, they were used for uh, trying to predict the, the trajectories of planets from a series of observations and so on. And the uh, uh, linear models for classification, such as, as probit regression or logistic regression, they date from the beginning of, of the, the 20th century. 
So profit regression is similar to, lo uh, to logistic regression, but it just uses a, a different function uh, for linking. So that, uh, uh, that inverts of the cumulative normal distribution. But it's the same idea. You have a, a, a weighted sum of the inputs, and then you use this linking function to give you something that seems like a probability, and use that for classification. So basically, these work because the human uh, chooses the right features to feed into the model, and then the model does a linear separation of the example and uh, learns how best to separate them, but always with a linear classification. In the 1990s, uh, things changed quite a bit because of uh, uh, these um, kernel tricks for support factor machines, random forests, and so on, and where we had uh, started to have a way of training models that were not linear uh, uh, models, so they could go beyond that. The basic idea here is that there was uh, the human would do this feature extraction, feed the right features into the model, the model will do a nonlinear transformation, and then a linear classification after this nonlinear transformation. And this uh, uh, had a big success because now suddenly the models could be much more powerful uh, in classifying data. And also, uh, it was the beginning in the early 90s of uh, starting to uh, make available standard databases for uh, developing these models and testing them and so on. And this uh, was uh, basically the condition for uh, the growing success of machine learning. But why is this important, this middle step here of doing this nonlinear transformation? The idea is that we can have a linear uh, classifier, something that works well if we can separate the, uh, the subset, the, the different classes, with a linear separation. Uh, for example, with logistic regression, in, with logistic regression we use this logistic function and then we select the threshold to uh, separate the class. So this is a, a linear uh, classifier because we, we try to minimize this logistic loss by trying to uh, fit the output of the model, which is a, a, an estimate of the probability of belonging to a class, and we fit that to an actual class label. And when we do that, we get something like this. For example, the blue one here has a class label of zero. The red one, ha uh, the red class has a class label of one. So our model fits the probability estimate to uh, the two classes. And now we choose a threshold value there, a cutoff point, to separate the two classes. But since these uh, values are a function of a linear combination of the points, this is always a straight line. So we can do this for, uh, for uh, data like this, it works. But if we have data that cannot be linearly separated, has some uh, twists and turns on the frontier, then this will no longer work. However, we can make this work if we transform the data. For example, this, uh, this set of points separated in blue and red cannot be, uh, uh, the two classes cannot be separated by a straight line because we have some red points here a bit above where they should be and the blue one uh, somewhere below. But this is for two dimensions. We have w uh, one input here, one input here, and the two coordinates. If we create a third dimension by multiplying the two inputs, then these, uh, these uh, points that were initially in a plane will now be in a twisted surface in, in three dimensions. And if we train a linear classifier in three dimensions with after this transformation, then it's actually doing something that curves in the original dimension space because we were splitting the, the points after we twisted uh, their position. And we can do this by uh, changing the transformations, increasing the dimensions and so on. So this was uh, a method that was found to greatly improve the power of uh, the classifier and uh, specifically in the case of support vector machines, the, the model is looking at the inner product of the, the feature of pairs of, of uh, examples. And if we use the kernel function, which is something that can give us the result of the inner product after some transformation, we can use very complex transformations implicitly without computational costs and actually the support factor machine will take the features we chose 
will implicitly transform everything with nonlinear transformations to a very high dimensional space and then do the linear classification there and this rather cheaply so we can uh, use this power to uh, classify many different sets. So for example, uh, polynomial kernel has this, uh, uh, this expression here. We multiply, we compute the inner product of two vectors. We add a constant and for example square or cube or so, or so on the, the result which is a, a scalar value. And this is the equivalent of doing a very large transformation polynomial expansion of, this, of each of the vectors. So something similar to what I'm showing here, but computationally it's much less expensive. So when we use support vector machines with these kind of kernels, we can uh, train them to fit uh, the data very well because they are expanding the data and doing these nonlinear transformations before doing the classification. Of course, there is uh, a bit of a problem here, not only uh, the different models and uh, these tricks for uh, expanding the data, which was demonstrated in the, the late 90s. So basically, if an algorithm performs better than average on a specific set of problems, then it will compensate that by performing below average on some other problems. Now, the thing is that this is a, a theoretical uh, conclusion where problems can be anything. So you can imagine that the data can be anything that is logically possible. And if a model is good on some subset of those sets, then it will be bad on others. Of course, in real life, not everything that would be mathematically possible actually happens. So real life is a very biased subset of all logical possibilities. And in real life, some models will work better in, one, uh, in some cases uh, and others in others. But in general, this is the, the idea that there is no single model that will work better for all uh, examples, or for all uh, problems. This means that we will need to create different models for different tasks if we want the, the best result. And also there is this problem of overfitting, which is when we are uh, trying to solve these problems, the main thing is to extrapolate from the data that we know to new examples that we still haven't met. Because it, it's not very useful to have to train a model to tell us what we already know. What we want to do is to, for it to give us some information about new examples. And this problem of extrapolating from the training examples to outside that set uh, gives us the, the possibility of overfitting, which is to uh, adjust too much to the data that we have, and then we cannot generalize properly. So this can happen if we increase too much the, the power of the model. So if the model is uh, too capable of adjusting to the tiny details on our data set, then it will probably find things that do not generalize well. And we have these uh, overfitting curves. Well, where if we increase the power of the model, the model we can uh, gradually decrease the error in the training set. But at some point outside the training set, things will start to, to go bad. So this is a, a problem that we have and gives us some requirements of what we need when we are trying to solve machine learning problems. So for the problem of overfitting, we need to measure overfitting. This, if you did machine learning, you had a whole semester of me telling you this, but otherwise uh, I'll just say it again anyway, it's worth saying uh, as many times as possible, you have to evaluate the, the results outside the training set. In, uh, most, in many cases, if we are not dealing with too much data and we have models that train sufficiently fast, we can do things like cross-validation, where we train the same model many times and average the error outside the training set. With deep learning, that's usually not done because first, we need lots of data for deep learning, so usually we have enough data for a training set, a validation set, and a test set, and also because the models take very long to train. So, try, so doing everything five times or ten times just to get this, this average uh, usually does not pay off. So in general, what we'll do is we will use a set of examples for training and uh, leave out a set of examples for validation during training and then also usually leave out a, uh, another set just to uh, evaluate the error at the end. 
Uh, and what we need to do to prevent overfitting is things like uh, uh, adjusting how the training goes, so regularization, we will cover that, but also importantly select the, the appropriate model. The same model will not work, will not be the best one in all cases, and we need to pick the right one for each problem. It's always possible to uh, uh, mitigate overfitting by having more data. And the more data that we have, the smaller the risk that we are learning things in the training set that do not generalize outside the training set. So one thing would be, uh, that would be good in a, a model or a family of models is if it's able to use uh, lots of data. Because if we have it, we want to be able to use it. <coughs> so, this is basically what we need uh, for machine learning. We need to do some kind of non-linear transformations because otherwise we cannot do much uh, classification in realistic problems. Uh, we need to be able to find different models for different problems because there is no single model that can solve everything equally well. And we also need the right features. I did not discuss much about this, but this should be intuitive. We need to feed the inputs into the model, and if the inputs have no relation to what we want on the output, then the learner will not learn anything useful and it will need to receive uh, uh, inputs that are uh, features that are as informative as possible. We also need to prevent overfitting so we need to be able to select the best models and, and use other techniques to, to minimize overfitting and our models should be able to uh, handle large amounts of data because this improves uh, learning. So in classic machine learning we have many algorithms that do nonlinear transformations. This was precisely why uh, machine learning started to, to uh, kick off in the, the, uh, in the 90s. Uh, we also have many different models, but here that is a bit of a, of, of a problem because they are really very different. So random forest, the part vector machine, naive bays, uh, k nearest neighbor, things like that, they work in very different ways. They need very different implementations. They can take different kinds of data and so on. And so there is a good diversity of, of uh, uh, approaches, but it, it's really uh, too much diversity perhaps. We also need the right features and we have to do this. So the dat data scientists typically have to select which kinds of features. There are methods for uh, helping select the features, but usually someone has to think about what the features will be, extract them, uh, select them, and so on. We have ways of preventing overfitting, so we, we saw that last semester, but they usually depend on the algorithm. So uh, different models and different algorithms will have different ways of regularization and such. And the ability to use large amounts of data varies a bit. So there are some versions, for example, support vector machines, classical support vector machines are not good for large amounts of data because the, the computational demands are quadratic in the number of examples because of those uh, dot products between all the pairs. There are some variants that use incremental learning and so on, but, but you need to adjust the models and for some it's harder than others to handle large amounts of data. So here comes the promise of uh, deep learning that I will try to convince you of this in the, in the next week, that it helps a lot with uh, all of these aspects. So we can do nonlinear transformations. We just stack uh, neurons and uh, they will do nonlinear transformations. We can create many different models with uh, 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 neural networks, but they are all based on the same basic element. So this would be like the Lego. We uh, build our models and they all work the same fundamental way, but they can be very different. Uh, Finding the right features to feed the model is a lot simpler with deep learning because the network itself will learn which are the right features. So as we stack layers in deep models, many of those layers will simply transform the data to find the correct features for the final layers to do the classification. There are many ways to do regularization and these are really models for handling large amounts of data. The way they are trained and they work best with large amounts of data. So I would like you to see deep models as a way of solving these uh, problems or difficulties that we had in uh, classical or the traditional machine learning approach. There is, however, one drawback 
is that these things take a lot longer to train than the others. So if there's anything that you can solve with logistic regression or k nearest neighbor or something like that, you don't need to go into deep learning because you'd just be wasting electricity with that. But there are lots of things that you cannot solve uh, easily with, with those other models, and that's what deep learning is for. So to sum up this first part, uh, the overview of the course, if you have questions about assignments and so on, just email me, but this information should be in clips and in the page. Um, and I'll talk a bit about how uh, machine learning relates to AI, this, uh, this progression, and how deep learning fits into machine learning. So, important concepts here. For those of you who did machine learning, you probably still remember this, but in any case, you should uh, understand this idea of doing nonlinear transformations for uh, being able to do classification. Uh, basically, you can think of even as a, a deep neural network that has lots of neurons. The neuron at the end is just a linear classifier, but everything before is just massaging the data until it gets the right shape for the one at the end. Uh, and then this problem of overfitting. We'll be seeing this in practice uh, quite a lot, but if the model is too powerful and learns too much about the, the data, the training data, then it may have problems generalizing outside the training data. Um, and I finished uh, this first part with this promise that deep learning helps solve a lot of problems with, uh, uh, with machine learning. So to give, uh, to read on uh, a first overview of uh, uh, deep learning, you have this, uh, and machine learning in general, you have the, the introductory chapter of the two books, and chapter five of deep learning talks about machine learning in general. So especially for those of you who did not do machine learning courses before, you should uh, read that chapter.